It's good to see familiar faces from student ministries. Each week I'm back across on the other side uh, with our junior hires and high schoolers. And I, I just want to commend to you junior hires, high schoolers who are here and those who might be listening online. Get your heart in front of all of God's word. This isn't for the adults only. And as you do it, it I'm so grateful that we're recording this. And I, I do pray that this would be a sweet resource for our body for years and years to come. So as you uh, take your own heart through God's word on your own, whether it's in Build, Wellspring, Read Through the Bible in a Year plan, or however you do it, um, I'm excited to add Habakkuk to the mix of resources that we have. So Habakkuk, I was just talking to somebody before the service who knows his Bible well and confessed, I don't know what Habakkuk's about. Uh, I really want to remedy that tonight. It is a, an incredibly pertinent book to your life, to my life. It will help us trust God and live lives marked by faith. That's the point. That's its purpose. Particularly when our faith is tested. When things get hard. When we're confused. When you have questions for God. Habakkuk will help. The author of the book, Habakkuk, a prophet in Judah finds himself here facing some conditions that challenge his faith severely. From a dark place, surrounded by a sinful nation, Habakkuk cries out to God with some sincere questions, and God answers. And Habakkuk is moved from chapter 1 to chapter 3 from distress to hope from questioning to trust and worship. And the Bible and Habakkuk never make light of the troubles that this world brings, but this book does put them in their proper perspective. So God's answer, Habakkuk asks a question and God answers. Habakkuk asks another question, God answers. Those answers aren't for Habakkuk only, they were meant for the people of his generation and the ones to follow. And it's by God's providence for you and for me. This book has a particularly sweet place for me personally, as it has been a sweet, sustaining source of truth, encouragement, help, and perspective for me in times of, of testing. I have so much to say to commend the book to you, but it, it seems like the best way to convince you of your need to know this precious book is just to jump in. So uh, towards the back of your Old Testament, let's open up Habakkuk and read. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version for most of this message. But first, let's pray. God, thank you for your word where you disclose yourself to us, where you tell us of things that we would never otherwise know. Your word where we find instruction, your word where through endurance and encouragement we may find hope. God, I pray that you would guard and guide my words tonight, that I would speak accurately, clearly, and I pray for my listeners that your Holy Spirit wouldn't only be active up here through my mouth, but your Holy Spirit would be active in the ears and hearts and minds of those that hear. Thank you for your word. Be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So Habakkuk 1.1 begins the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. It starts very much the same as Nahum, the minor prophet that Ben taught us from last week, the oracle. It's, both of these books declare themselves to be oracles or messages that didn't originate with the author. And just like all of scripture, though this was written by Habakkuk, the prophet is merely the instrument to record the God-breathed words of this scripture. 
So Habakkuk says clearly wrote the book. He lived in the southern kingdom of Judah during the late 7th century. You might not know what that means, but we've been, we've been sitting in this history for a little bit, so you might. It's about 100 years after Israel had been conquered and carried into exile, maybe a decade or two after, uh, maybe the decade following um, when Babylon was, ended up conquering Assyria that we heard about last week. And the generations or the kings that had been leading Judah, remember we're talking about the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom's already gone. The southern kingdom, they'd been led by some pretty bad leaders in recent history with one exception. There was foolish King Hezekiah and then his son Manasseh at the beginning of that seventh century BC. As, as we read of Manasseh in 2 Kings, we'll get a glimpse into the spiritual situation that would have surrounded uh, Habakkuk. This is speaking of the king in the line of David, of the nation that was supposed to replace the godlessness in the land. It says, and Manasseh burned his son as an offering. This is 2 Kings 21.6. Manasseh burned his son as an offering and used fortune-telling and omens and dealt with mediums and necromancers. This is the leader of God's people. He did much evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger. And the carved images of the Asherah that he had made, he set up in the house of Yahweh, in the house that was said to David and Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, I have chosen, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not cause my feet to wander anymore out of the land that I gave to their fathers. If only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them. But they did not listen. And Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. The leaders of God's people, and the, those from David's line, sitting on the promised throne in particular, led the people to do more evil than the nations Israel was sent to replace. The wicked cycle that we saw from the judges has continued and crescendoed. Manasseh was followed by his son Ammon, who it says in 2 Kings 21, 20, uh, mimicked his father Manasseh's godlessness and idol worship. Then we had the bright spot of King Josiah. Uh, Habakkuk may have prophesied in the time of Josiah, perhaps right before, maybe right after. Josiah was a bright spot. He reigned for 31 years and he turned to Yahweh with all of his heart according to the law of Moses. But you can imagine that even though that single leader was godly, the centuries deep godlessness rampant throughout Judah certainly remained embedded among the people. For as soon as Josiah died, the throne under Jehoahaz and the nation returned to doing, uh, 2 Kings twenty-three thirty-two, what was evil in the sight of Yahweh and so on and so forth until they were exiled. The Yahweh-fearing prophet Habakkuk found himself living in that setting, in, among the wickedness of Judah, and he knew that they were to be a called-out people from the nations as holy. God's law had recently been reintroduced to the nation under Josiah's reforms. He would have read God's word and seen the nations and been understandably confused. So the prophet was troubled and he looked around Jerusalem and instead of holiness, he saw violence. Instead of a nation marked by following God's law, he saw justice perverted. He may have, he, he probably found himself even on the receiving hands, receiving end of injustice at the hands of his countrymen. And so he prays and this is Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4. It's Habakkuk's first question. 
How long, O Lord? How long, O Yahweh, shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. So this, isn't apparent, this apparently isn't Habakkuk's first prayer of this kind. He's been praying it for a while. And he, he, he says, how long do I have to cry out for help? Seems like you're not hearing, Yahweh. It feels like his prayers are falling on deaf ears. Habakkuk hates the godlessness, the iniquity, the lawlessness, and the injustice all around him. He knows that God, God's character, he knows that God sh- hates those things as well. But it feels like he's crying for help and Yahweh doesn't hear At least that's the conclusion he draws because Yahweh's not doing anything, it appears. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce comments, he says, this is clearly an anguished cry from a man who loves justice. He had seen justice perverted and cried out to God against the evil. It's the kind of cry we might utter over the deplorable state of the church in our days or the equally deplorable moral decline in America. God, do you see what's going on around us? Uh, How long will I cry and you not hear? Seems to Habakkuk like justice will never go forth. But Habakkuk's timeline and our timeline are often quite different things from God's timeline. God does hear. There is no prayer that you can utter that God does not hear. And Habakkuk was praying according to God's character. He was praying against things that God did indeed hate and God promised to remove from his people. Justice will come. Holiness will come to God's people, but just because it is delayed doesn't mean it's deficient. This reminds me of 2 Peter 3, 8 and God's patience in our day, bringing about the promised judgment. It says, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Christian, as we wait patiently until the coming of the Lord, follow the command from James 5.13. It's given in a context of unjust suffering. It says, are any of you suffering? Let him pray. And that's, that's what Habakkuk did. Many times in scripture, we hear God's people cry out, questioning God and asking for help. And God never fails to hear our prayers. Every word spoken aloud or in the silent cries from your, within your heart, every single word is heard by our holy, all-powerful, caring, self-giving God. And God is not too busy running the universe though he does indeed run it down from the smallest subatomic reality out to the cosmic interaction that we can't even fathom of galaxies and everything in between from the rise and fall of nations to the hair falling out of your head. He knows each of your hairs He cares and guides for each of your days. Nothing happens apart from him, and he wants us to pray. And if he cares for the birds and the flowers, he will give you what you need. Not everything you want, 
with everything you need. Not always on the timeline that we think is best, but according to the perfect counsel of his will. And so just as James teaches that we ought, whether we're suffering or cheerful, pray, the despairing Habakkuk prayed. And in this case, God responds verbally and specifically to Habakkuk's prayer. But it wasn't the answer Habakkuk was looking for. So Yahweh responds with his difficult answer. This is 1, 5 through 11. Read with me. This is God's answer to Habakkuk's first question. He goes, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from their selves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all of their faces forward. They gather captives like sand, and at kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. They sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Habakkuk looked at the sin and suffering and violence around him and said, God, are you going to do something? And Yahweh responded, I, I am doing something. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. God had already promised to do this. Uh, he specifically told Hezekiah this through Isaiah like a hundred years before. He promised to, Isra or to Israelites in the wilderness through Moses 800 years before. This discipline will come if you don't follow my, my law. But I don't think this was what Habakkuk had in mind when he he said, God, how long am I going to cry out to you and you not here? Okay, there's violence all around me. And God says, I'm doing something. It's about to get way worse. God says, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Martin Lloyd-Jones commented on this phrase helpfully. I want to skim past it, that God is raising up the Chaldeans. He said, every nation on earth is under the hand of God. There is no power in this world that is not ultimately controlled by him. Things are not what they appear to be. It seemed to be the astute military prowess of the Chaldeans that had brought them into ascendancy, but it was not so at all. For God had raised them up. God is the Lord of history. He is seated in the heavens. And the nations to him are as grasshoppers and as a drop in the bucket. Or as the small dust of the balance. The Bible asserts that God is over all. He started the historical process. He is controlling it. And he is going to end it. We must never lose sight of this crucial fact. Martin Lloyd-Jones taught that to his body in the context of World War II. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but the world, when it seems out of control, do not forget that crucial fact that a nation does not rise, a nation does not fall apart from the hand of the Lord. God is accomplishing things that we would not believe even if told. And the reality is we don't need to know what he's up to because we know his character and we know his purposes are trustworthy. But Habakkuk gets a glimpse and we looking back on, on biblical history know some of God's purposes in raising up the Chaldeans. But their means, they will conquer with a violence far greater than that violence which moved Habakkuk to pray. 
Indeed, it says in verse 9, they come for violence. And to top it off, God doesn't, he's not disillusioned with the kinds of people he's raising up. He says, verse 11, the conquering army that will sweep by as unstoppable as the wind. God himself says, they're guilty men whose own might is their God. Habakkuk says, God, are you going to do something? Because he says, I, I am. But for Habakkuk, this solution raises more problems and questions than, than answers. The solution seems even worse than the initial problem of lawlessness in Judah. Yet Judah has sinned and discipline is understandable, even right, but Babylon? How could God use a nation as proud, wicked, idolatrous, and violent as Babylon to judge Judah's pride, wickedness, idolatry, and violence? Habakkuk didn't anticipate this response, and he probably wanted God to answer by saying, I'm going to bring the nation to repentance. Maybe he could raise another king even better than Josiah to lead the nation in mass to repentance. Maybe he could deal individually with the offenders. But the Babylonians, they were going to wipe the whole nation away. The righteous with the wicked. God was going to bring Judgment by a nation more wicked than the people they were judging, it would seem. It's maybe a helpful modern day analogy uh, by Boyce to help us get into Habakkuk's shoes. It would be like us, remember back to the illustration you had of, of us crying out, saying, God, can you do something about the, the state of the church in America, the state of our country? It would be like us crying out to God about the state of the visible church in America and then hearing that God is going to destroy that church by a communist invasion. At first, we would have been quite critical of the failures of God's people. We would have pointed to lax theological standards and even open heresy in some places, to lack of discipline and open immorality. We would have been asking for renewed movement of God's spirit and would have been distressed that our prayers had gone unanswered for such a long time. But then after God had replied that he was going to destroy the church by an invasion of utter unbelievers, we too might find ourselves protesting. And God knew that this would be hard for Habakkuk to swallow. I too have to admit that I have a hard time wrapping my mind around how God could use guilty, sinful men to accomplish his purposes? How God can govern sinful humans, even raising up sinful people to do sinful things and to do it without becoming unholy, unjust, impure, or evil? But this is where we need our minds informed by God's word and not our logic and intuition. For throughout all of scripture, and this is most clearly seen at the cross, we see God presenting himself, right? Scripture is God's revelation of who he is to us. We see God presenting himself as the ruler of all, good and evil included, ruling for his glory, accomplishing his perfect purposes, and he does so unstained by sin, perfectly holy. John Piper, in his very good book, Providence, writes of this scripture-given perspective and why we need to saturate our mind with God's word. He says, the Bible teaches clearly and repeatedly that God governs sinful choices that he can do it without becoming unholy or unjust or impure or evil. When we enter the Bible, we enter a world of thought about God very different from our own. From beginning to end, we find believers 
and the inspired spokesman of Scripture bowing without hesitation before God's rule over good and evil. God's all-encompassing providence over evil, as well as good, is expressed so many times in Scripture without pause or without pause to question it, that we realize that we are in a world of thought that assumes God's absolute right and power to direct human choices according to his holy purposes. There is a biblical mindset that seems to have a built-in presupposition that God, with perfect justice, holiness, goodness, and wisdom, guides the good and evil choices of all humans. This mindset is, by and large, foreign to our modern world. We often cry contradiction where the Bible sees none. God can raise up the Chaldeans. God knew that this would be hard for Habakkuk, and that's why Yahweh started his answer with, I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. The hard part to believe isn't that God would keep his repeated promises of exile to his people but that God would orchestrate even sinful people doing sinful things to perfectly accomplish his good purposes for his glory and his people's good. And so Habakkuk asks a a second question. Read it with me. It's uh, Habakkuk 1, start with 12 and 13. He, He goes back to God's character that he knows is true. He says, Are you not from everlasting, O Yahweh my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. He knows God's made some promises to these people. We're not going to die. O Lord, you've ordained them as judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent? When the wicked swallows up a man more righteous than he. So first Habakkuk starts his prayer by declaring what he knows to be true of God. This is a really good practice that if you don't already do in prayer, you ought to start. He's praying to Yahweh, the Holy One, who gave his name and promises to Israel through the patriarchs and through Moses, who had promised an everlasting covenant, an everlasting kingdom, and a national presence for perpetuity with Yahweh in the promised land. God cannot do wrong and he cannot lie. He is holy and he is Israel's God. So Habakkuk rightly concludes, we we shall not die. This isn't the end of Israel. And he humbly acknowledges that Yahweh's purpose in raising up the Babylonians and Chaldeans are right. You have ordained them for judgment and established them for reproof. But the the problem in Habakkuk's mind is, God, how can you use such a wicked people to accomplish your means? The struggle isn't with the coming discipline for Israel, but that God would use such a wicked people doing such wicked things to accomplish those purposes. The Babylonians aren't going to give Yahweh glory. He likens what they will do to Israel like a fisherman who uses a huge dragnet to indiscriminately catch and destroy everything without distinction in its path. The coming conquest will carry away the righteous and the sinner alike from among Judah, seemingly without distinction. And the wicked ones doing the conquest won't even give God glory. They will be like the fishermen who sacrifice to their net rather than God who provides for their daily needs. God is too pure to look upon and tolerate evil, Habakkuk knows. And since this is true, his his reproof of Israel makes sense but not his use of the Babylonians to accomplish it. So Habakkuk continues his question in verse 14. We're going to read 14 through 17. Habakkuk writes, You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing the nations forever? Yahweh responded to his first question. So like a a watchman diligently, patiently, expectantly waits and watches from his watchtower. 
Habakkuk watched for God's response. There's a sermon here that I don't have time for, but don't grow tired of searching God's complete and perfect revealed word for answers to problems. Sit in the chair with your heart full of prayer and Bible open from a position of faith and dependency and trust and search God's word for answers like Habakkuk asked. Don't be scared to ask the questions, but ask them with expectancy and with faith, knowing that God's words are where the answers will be found. God's word in his word. But so Habakkuk 2.1, he says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he'll say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And God answered. Verse 2. But before God answered, he said, he told Habakkuk to write the words of this vision down. 2-2. Yahweh answered me. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. God's words were not for Habakkuk only. They must be recorded because they were for the people of Judah and the generations of faithful who would come and find themselves in different but similarly perplexing tests of their faith. And the words of God were plain. They needed to be made plain because God's words in Scripture are understandable. They are clear. God writes his words with the intention and ability to be understood. There's an ironic theological word for this clarity and understandability of Scripture. It's uh, perspicuity. When we speak of the perspicuity of Scripture, it just means you can understand it. God wrote his word to be understandable. And God wrote his his word with a purpose And the purpose that Habakkuk needed is what we need when we find ourselves in these situations. It's hope. I think I have time. Can you turn in your Bibles to Romans 15, 4? For whatever, Romans 15, 4, Paul writes, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. God's word, all of it, and particularly in view here is the Old Testament, is written for our instruction so that we could have hope if we endure and get the encouragement that God's word intends. Christian, you're in your trials, and you will face them, Jesus promised. You are meant to have hope. Omri taught helpfully this morning the command, do not fear. What is the means to not fear? The means to not fear is to put your hope in God. And the means of having hope in God is you endure under the instruction of God's word, receiving the encouragement in God's word. These words of Habakkuk are no exception. That's why God said, write them down, make it plain. Indeed, they are some of the most encouraging and helpful words in all of God's recorded words to help us endure our trials with faith. So this vision wasn't for Habakkuk only, but it needed to be written down and sent out among God's people like one might send a runner proclaiming an important message. And Yahweh answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may, who, uh, so that he may run who reads it. For still, the vision awaits its appointed time. It's important. It's not here yet. It awaits it, its appointed time. But it hastens to the end. It won't lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. The culmination 
We always answered Habakkuk's question would come, but at the appointed time. It will come as assuredly as if it had already happened. You could look back at God's salvation of Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus and say, okay, God recorded those words. His promised words of what will come at the appointed time are just as assured as history, his history future that he writes is just as certain as his history past that he writes. And just like 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. He's always right on time and he has set an appointed time. But it might not come in the prophet's lifetime, but it would come without delay according to Yahweh's timing. And so God puts immediately in front of Habakkuk and us the question of trust. Despite what it looks like, God has given promises and he will keep them on time. But on his time, are you willing to wait? And now we get to God's response. He says, write down what I'm about to say. So we're ready. What, what are you going to say, God? The climax of the book and the message of Habakkuk, which includes one of the most important verses of all the Bible. Remember, Habakkuk had asked in 1.13, he said, you who are pure eyes and to see evil, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent? Here's God's answer. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol, like death that never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all people. Some translations say verse 4, as for the proud one, but the ESV does a good job of bringing out the Hebrew. The wicked one has a soul that is puffed up. The word here for puffed up is used in this noun form in 1 Samuel 5 to describe the tumors that erupted in judgment over the bodies of the Philistines at Ashdod. If you remember, they stole the, the Ark of the Covenant and Dagon fell down. They all got, um, they all got the tumors and then they, they sent the, the Ark back. Their soul is swollen up, perhaps like a cancerous, unsatisfiable mass. Perhaps like a dead animal swelling up in the noonday sun is how God describes the soul of these people that Habakkuk says, are you, are you going to do nothing? Their greedy hearts were like a cancer that grows and grows until it destroys its host. Right? Habakkuk was concerned that God was being idle while the Babylonians were conquering. It seemed like God was maybe blessing the Babylonians for their wickedness when he should have been judging. But God points out that now even judgment, even now judgment has begun. Their soul is puffed up and crooked. It won't be satisfied. Their greed is like death itself. It'll never have enough. Sure, they will conquer, but they won't enjoy it. It won't satisfy them. Their greed and is like wine that promises pleasure, but ultimately is a traitor that leaves you drunk and hungover, miserable, but always wanting more. Sure, they'd be surrounded in luxury with rich food while God's people were in exile, but they'd never be satisfied. You see, judgment for sin is already underway for those practicing it. Sin is a horrible lie. It promises joy, but it will always leave you empty. It promises you just a little bit more, and then you'll really be able to live the good life. But in the end, it will never satisfy. And like a worm hiding the deadly hook from a fish, it will only ever lead to death. Remember this next time you're tempted by sin. No, Habakkuk, these will not live but the righteous, they will live. And they'll live by their faith. The unrighteous live for today. They live for themselves. And at the end of that living is surely death. It won't end in the pleasures and joys that they seek. And ultimately, as we will shortly read, it will end on the day of the Lord in utter shame, where they will indeed drink, but not the wine which they slavishly served but they'll drink the cup of Yahweh's wrath. 
that he has been storing up in righteous judgment. God is not idle. He sees every work. He will avenge. He will make right. The unrighteous who've lived for themselves, whose power and pleasures are their own God, they will not live. But the righteous, Yahweh declares, will live by their faith. The wicked live for themselves in faithlessness. The righteous will live by their faith. When calamity comes, when suffering comes, Yahweh's righteous won't live for themselves. They will be distinct from those around them. They won't trust in what they see. They won't hope in their circumstances, but they will trust in Yahweh and his promises, his character and his word. And their life will show it. The remnant of faithful Jews needed this encouragement, this hope, as they would need to endure the upcoming years of increasing wickedness in Judah and then endure the unspeakable horrors of the conquest that we read about that Smed preached on from Lamentations and elsewhere. They would have to endure the exile. And God's faithful throughout all time need to know this message that we could endure in faith and hope or that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And God continues his response by proclaiming five woes of judgment, right? Five woes of judgment that are sure to come in God's perfect timing. Habakkuk need not fret. The wicked will not escape unpunished. God will not go without his glory. Habakkuk 2.6 Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations and all the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth. to cities and to all who dwell with them. The tables will turn in God's time. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life, for the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from, the, from Yahweh of hosts that the peoples labor merely for fire and the nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself, show your uncircumcision. The cup of Yahweh's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will, cover, will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them for the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. <clears throat> what prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies for its maker trusts in its own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver and there's no breath in it at all. In the end, at God's appointed time, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. God will, God is not idle. They will not get away with it. The arrogance of the Chaldeans will come to a woeful end, as will the arrogance of all unrighteous. And any in Judah or elsewhere who humbly trust in God will gain his life, even if he dies. The righteous shall live by faith. And ultimately, at God's appointed time, the heavens will open, and the one called faithful and true, who judges in righteousness, will burst onto the scene. 
His eyes are aflame, clothed in garment, dipped in bl- clothed in a garment dipped in blood. With a word that comes forth like a devastating sword, he will strike down the nations. Don't mistake God's patience for inability. Don't mistake God's delay for idleness. With a word, the king will return and the world will be silenced and the impotence of mankind's strength will be made instantly obvious before the king's powerful might. The things in which mankind, the Chaldeans and all the idolatrous people before and after them will instantly become their shame. There will not be a single act of injustice or wickedness that will not be judged. And those that will not be judged by the Lord. And if you look at your life and you think, okay, I'm good because I'm not as bad as the murderous Babylonians. I'm not that selfish. I didn't plunder nations and build a town with blood. I'm not that evil. You've completely missed the point. You will find out too that you will not escape God's judgment. These woes are not for those really bad people, those really bad Chaldeans. It's tucked into the powerful verse of, of Habakkuk 2.4 is a statement that we cannot miss. It will be the righteous, the just who live. Paul latches on to this. The Bible is clear, as Romans 3 says, that none is righteous, no, not one. So if it will be the righteous who will live by faith, but there are none righteous, if there's a spectrum of righteousness, you have the unrighteous over here and you have the righteous over here, and you say, okay, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they're way over here, right? They, they, they're over here with Hitler. They murdered people. They, just, they came for violence. Where are you on the spectrum? Right there with them. On, on a scale, on an infinite scale, when righteousness is measured by God's perfect standard, we're, we're just in a big old clump of unrighteousness over here. Do not measure yourself against each other. But if God says there's righteous who are going to live by faith, how, how do you become righteous? Well, well, the only way is if you got a foreign righteousness, some perfect righteousness from this side given to you so that you could be declared righteous. And well, more than a thousand years before Habakkuk, God saw Abraham's faith, his trust in God's promises and declared on the basis of faith Abraham to be righteous, even though he was a sinner, just like the rest. In his divine forbearance, God passed over Abraham's sins and so many others, Christian including yours and mine. And there is only one ever one way to ever be righteous before God, and that's on the basis of faith. If you think that you're going to work your way up you're never going to do it. God doesn't say, oh, in the, when he says the righteous will live by faith as if it's the righteous who will live because of their works. No, no they've been declared righteous because of the, on the basis of faith. They haven't done anything to make themselves righteous. God gave them that. And they will show their faith on the basis of which God declared them righteous in the way that they live in trials. This is the truth that uh, is referred to so much in in Romans, in the book of Galatians. The author to the, the Hebrews cites this verse. I wish I could go on from here. This is just a summary. There is so much here. But I want you to know that at the cross, God proved that he does take sin seriously, right? Habakkuk was wondering, God, do you take sin seriously? He goes, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish it all. And for you righteous who are going to live, God showed later what Habakkuk didn't know. That cup of, of wrath in Yahweh's right hand that was going to come around. Jesus asked the Father to take it from him, but if, if it was his will, he would. And Jesus drank it down to the very Last, he went to the cross and drank that cup to the very bottom. God proved that he takes sin seriously. So when you find yourself surrounded by evil and it looks like God is sitting by idly, 
passively, maybe aloof, you can confidently know that God will judge. These woes and more will come upon the evildoer. Or if they repent, they were placed on Christ on the cross. Even more than that, we know that we can trust God in his ordering of the universe and his superintending of human rebellion to accomplish his will. Right? Just like he was doing with the Chaldeans, raising up evil people to do what he predestined to take place for his good and God's glory. That's what he did at the cross. Acts 4.28, when Jesus was crucified, there were gathered together kings, Jews, Gentiles to do whatever your hand, God, planned and predestined to take place. And with that sovereign superintending of evil, God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when you face a trial, a testing of your faith, trust God. Let that faith be shown in the way that you live. So when Habakkuk sees this vision and writes it plainly, he leads all of his readers in the right response of worship and faith. Chapter 3 is a psalm. It's a song of worship, a song of response. It isn't meant for us to sit back and read, okay, I wonder what, how Habakkuk responded. And you sit and you passively read it. You are meant to participate. It is a song to be sung with stringed instruments. The intended audience was not limited to the doomed residents of Judah, but included any who would face similar stark circumstances from the hand of the Lord. God has just spoken of the irrefutable demonstration of his power that will come in the future to destroy his enemies and protect his people. So Habakkuk's song looks forward to the appointed time and also looks back to the Exodus where the same God came and saved his people. In this song, it feels as he writes, like Habakkuk has one eye looking back to the Pentateuch where God took his people out of Egypt in the Exodus, showing his mighty power. And he has one eye looking forward to the coming day of the Lord. In this recounting of God's demonstration of power and faithfulness, they're meant to sustain the faith of his faithful here and now. A faith in God that is content to have God, even if all else is taken away. Even if I lose everything this world could, could possibly offer, and in the face of the coming Chaldeans, Habakkuk knew that was a very real possibility. And face certain death through poverty and starvation, yet I will rejoice in God. This is the practical working out of what it means in 2.4, the righteous shall live by his faith. This is a faith that hopes in God no matter what. A faith that is content to have God, even if all else is stripped away. It's a faith that is willing to wait until God's appointed time and live a life of faith, trusting in him. Let's read the very end of Habakkuk's song. Start in verse 16. Habakkuk, sorry, I don't have time to read the whole thing. Habakkuk, says, I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. This is the, the sound of coming Yahweh. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. God, I trust, I trust you. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in Yahweh. Do you see this? Even if he loses everything, he will rejoice not in his circumstances, but in the God who governs the circumstances. If you get God and lose everything, we rejoice. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, Yahweh, the Lord is my strength. 
He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Do you notice that nothing changed for Habakkuk? He was still surrounded by sinful Judah. Judah would still be conquered. But God's answer assures Habakkuk and assures us that God is not absence in his patience. The proud whose God is their strength will perish in a woeful end. And the righteous shall live by faith. Habakkuk's circumstances haven't changed, but the encouragement of God's word has changed Habakkuk. His faith has been strengthened to endure the test ahead. Christian, you and I will have difficulties in our life. You might be in them now. And Habakkuk is intended to help you endure, to give you hope, to ultimately direct your faith away from yourself and your hope off your circumstances to God so that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, you may have hope. As a church, we've regularly sung the song Out of the Depths that finds many of its themes and even explicitly many of its lines drawn from this book. We've gone through some trials personally as, and as a church and have, been, have used these words to direct our, our thoughts, our prayers, and encourage our faith towards trust in the Lord. I wanted to sing that together as we end this book of Habakkuk. And I hope that I've encouraged you to dive deeper into this book, to know its content for yourself, that through endurance and the encouragement of Habakkuk, you may have hope.